Al Jazeera Podcasts. Sama Al Hamdani calls her family in Yemen often. My family and I check in every once in a while to just make sure that we're still in touch and keeping up with each other's lives. And on one of those calls in the middle of January, there was a special reason to check in. That same day, my youngest cousin had given birth. But in addition to celebrating, she learned airstrikes were hitting the Yemeni capital, Sana'a. She was bringing a newborn home. And I think that what comes to their mind is, where's the sound coming from, right? Like, is it close? How far is it? Is it likely to continue? The U.S. and U.K. have been launching these strikes in Yemen since January 12th. They're in retaliation for attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea by Yemen's Houthi rebels. But for some Yemenis, including Sama's family, it feels like the start of a dreaded escalation. I'm congratulating someone on having a new, a newborn, a new life in the house. And at the same time, it is the onset of panic of what this could mean for human life all over the city. So, as strikes continue to land in Yemen, and Houthis continue their attacks in the Red Sea, where does that leave the Yemeni people? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. The U.S. and U.K. have carried out a series of airstrikes in Yemen against what they say are Houthi military sites since the middle of January. There have been strikes in Sana'a, uh, the capital of Yemen, and we are told that U.S. jets from the carrier Eisenhower have been involved in those strikes. Uh, Sana'a's family members weren't the only ones to hear the airstrikes. The take spoke to two other people in Yemen. I was uh, asleep. Uh, me, uh, my wife, and uh, our two daughters. That's Hussein al bukhaiti He lives north of Sana'a. And of course, we woke up uh, because of the explosion. Hakim al masmari lives in Sana'a, and he said he and his neighbors also heard the explosion. It happened late at night. Children were crying uh, in, in fear. So families were basically, after uh, two years of you know, airstrikes are trying to calm the kids down and trying to change the topic or have them go back to sleep again. There's also a lot of fear that this could escalate and uh, cause uh, Yemen to suffer more than it suffered over the last 10 years. Over the last 10 years, Yemen has been mired in a civil war. Conflict had subsided recently, but it hasn't ended. But if the siege uh, returns, uh, People are worried that goods will have a hard time entering Yemen, uh, petrol, gasoline, etc. So there are worries that this could escalate and harm the people when it comes to their uh, basic goods, basic necessities. Sama Al Hamdani, who you heard from earlier, is not only in touch with people in Yemen, she's been studying the country for many years. I am a Yemen political analyst, and right now I'm working with a humanitarian tech company that focuses on work in the Middle East. So, Sama, welcome back to The Take. I know that you have family and friends in Yemen. What are they telling you about what's happening there and how they're reacting to these strikes? So, Yemenis have experienced war for the last nine years, from 2015 until today. We've been undergoing a conflict that hasn't concluded yet. And while it felt like we were closer than ever to peace, this began. And so Mm -hmm. to a lot of us, it feels like a restart, meaning that there's panic. There is a continuation or resuming of airstrikes that we haven't witnessed in some cities. Uh, And I would say that the people are quite resilient. And so people are doing their best to live their lives as much as possible. Mm -hmm. However, Mm -hmm. there is fear and concern that this could grow into a much larger conflict and bring on more devastation into Yemen. So for all intents and purposes, these airstrikes, they're a punishment. But I wonder if it feels like a punishment against just the Houthis, an armed group that controls most parts of Yemen, or against the Yemeni people themselves. 
The U.S. says they are attacking Houthi weapons targets, military targets, of little risk to civilians. But what does that actually look like on the ground? How are people's everyday lives affected when they know that there are airstrikes and more potential airstrikes overhead? Yeah, so I think that's that's kind of the risk of these operations, right? They want to target Houthi military sites. However, a lot of times these sites are very close to civilian property, to civilian facilities, to just civilians live amongst these sites a lot of times. And so we've seen a lot of this since 2015, where targeting a military site at times would also lead to tons of civilian casualties. Mm -hmm. But I think the fear here is, is how long will that last if this continues to intensify, which it looks like it will. So the strikes the U.S. and U.K. say are in retaliation for what the Houthis have been doing in the Red Sea, which is targeting international shipping off the coast of Yemen since November. Now, the Houthis say that they're striking ships that they deem linked to Israel in response to Israel's war in Gaza. The Yemeni armed forces are fully committed to continuing the operation. This is Yahya Sari, a Houthi spokesperson. We are ready to go to all fronts to fight for the occupied Palestinian territory. They've also launched missiles and drones towards Yemen. These moves are done in the name of helping the Palestinians in Gaza. But how much support do you think they really have inside Yemen? A very interesting question. I think that the Houthis are using this to gain popularity and recognition in the region, which is what they've long dreamed of. And I think that what's happening in Gaza has given them the opportunity to present themselves as just, rightful, and to represent the sentiment of millions of peoples in in the Middle East, you know? This is Yahya Sari speaking at a press conference on January 12th. This violent aggression will not deter Yemen from supporting the Palestinian people and stopping the oppression of the Palestinian people. We've seen protests throughout Yemen right after the airstrikes happened, where people came to the streets of Sana'a saying that they don't care if they get bombed by the U.S. and the U.K. as long as they continue to support their cause. Wow. Hussein, who you heard earlier seems to support Sama's point, saying the Houthi show of force inspired pride. My feeling when uh, the first UK and US strike uh, against uh, Yemen, I felt uh, proud of what Yemeni has done. The attack that Yemeni act- is conducting is really hurting Israeli regime. I mean, that's why United States and UK have sent all their uh, battleship. This means uh, that what Yemeni are doing actually is the right thing uh, to do. Now, as they say here in Yemen, we are actually facing the devil itself. And if the uh, United States considered you as a, a terrorist or is like fighting you and targeting you, we believe that actually we're doing uh, the right thing and we must continue uh, doing it. Of course, what's happening in Gaza is received uh, in the Middle East very differently than the way that it is received in the West. Uh, The Israeli attacks on Palestinians continue to be discussed and labeled as attacks on Arabs. Everyone's televisions is flooded with images that are truly unbearable to watch. And I would say that the majority of Arab countries have not been able to take a very strong position in front of the U.S., the U.K., and Israel in saying that enough is enough. Therefore, the Houthis were able to swoop in and kind of present themselves as a strong force that is willing to stand up to what some people may deem a bully. And I think that that's a very popular demand, not just in Yemen. People who oppose the Houthis share that demand with the Houthis. Even in countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, who've seen the Houthis as opponents for very long. I think a lot of people, the average citizen, of course, I'm not talking about the political systems, are feeling like what the Houthis are doing is righteous. I would say that the Houthis are doing very well at rebranding themselves. Do you think that that has or will change as these airstrikes increase? Because people had to know that there would be some response from Western countries 
So I would say that the majority understand what the ramifications of the Houthis' action mean on the Yemeni people. Meaning that a lot of Yemenis understand that whatever the Houthis are doing now could end their life at any moment if things get worse. Mm. So right now, Yemen's population is estimated at 34.4 million. 20 million people need health assistance. 4.5 million people are internally displaced. 17 million people are facing crisis of food. 2.2 of them are children under the age of five years old. Mm. And of course, what's happening now is going to make it a lot harder. Mm. So while... You know, from a position of uh, politics, it may seem like a bold, strong move that represents the Middle Eastern sentiment. I would say that it is essentially very devastating to an already impoverished, weak Yemen, where the Yemeni people will continue to pay the price because of what the Houthi militia is doing. After the break, the U.S. is not just striking back with weapons. What else is in store for Yemen? So, Sama, in February 2021, U.S. President Joe Biden took the Houthis off of two lists, the Foreign Terrorist Organization list and the Specially Designated Global Terrorist list. And that was in a move to allow for more humanitarian aid to Yemen. Then on January 17th... The U.S. will consider the Houthis a specially designated global terrorist group, blocking its access from the global financial system. The Iran back- His administration put them back on one of those lists, the second one, the specially designated global terrorists. What do these designations actually mean for people living in Yemen? Right now, the immediate reaction that we've seen is that the Houthis have asked people or civil society organization workers and humanitarian organization workers holding U.S. and U.K. passports to leave Houthi-controlled territory. The U.K. and American employees have one month to prepare for their departure. So it seems like a, a complete lack of communication between those two parts of the world is about to happen. The U.N. officials have taken note of this memo but have not taken any action as of now. Of course, it means that there's going to be ramifications in terms of aid coming in and in terms of how things will unfold. In the past, we've we've seen these sanctions come on, but they were quickly removed because a lot of humanitarian organizations couldn't operate on the ground with these designations in place. So then let's talk about the end game. There is now an almost viral video of President Biden that is circulating, where he's asked by a reporter about the U.S. airstrikes in Yemen and whether they are working. Well, when you say working, are they stopping the Houthis? No. Are they stopping the Houthis? No. Are they going to continue? Yes. Are they going to continue? Yes. So if the strikes aren't stopping the Houthis, as the president has admitted, from your viewpoint as an analyst, how effective are they really? Yeah, so I did watch that clip and I did find it really interesting because essentially what was happening in 2015 in Yemen until today in terms of a conflict cannot be separated from what is happening today. When this conflict first began, the Saudi Emirati coalition depended and relied on the UK and the US to obtain weapons and to get logistics. The U.S. has played a key role in the campaign, expediting weapons shipments and providing intelligence to Saudi Arabia, including direct targeting support for the coalition strikes. It was even given an American name. Saudi Arabia launched Operation Decisive Storm. Operation Decisive Storm, which is a very Mm. U.S. military approach to conflict. Mm -hmm. And so from the very start, it was to the advantage of the Houthis to make it look like they are fighting the U.S., 
And throughout that conflict, the U.S. managed to kind of distance itself from what's happening in Yemen by saying, no, this is a Saudi UAE-led conflict, and we don't have anything to do with it. We just sell them weapons. And I think we've come to a point today where it looks like the U.S. is directly in conflict with the Houthis in Yemen. Therefore, it looks to the supporters of the Houthis that they've been able to prove that the conflict is in fact with the U.S. and that Saudi Arabia and UAE were just middlemen. And so we now enter into a space where President Biden is looking for a quick solution to kind of reduce the effects of the Red Sea blockade. And it seems like the quickest reaction is to just punish them. Of course, if you had understood the conflict in Yemen, you understand that the Houthis don't give up, that these kind of behaviors only push them to react even more, which is what they're doing. But I think from the U.S.'s perspective, they want to completely dismantle their capacity to even launch an attack in the first place. And Hakim al-Masmari, who you heard from at the start of this episode, says that those attacks are launched for a cause that most Yemenis agree with. Gaza, people are trying to hope that the aid enters Gaza and this could all come to an end. But there are fears that if attacks from both the Houthis and the U.S. and U.K. continue, there could be dire consequences for Yemenis. The longer this continues, the more it escalates. And the more it escalates, the, the scarier it will be for Yemenis, ordinary Yemenis, who basically will suffer if this escalates into a real uh, stronger long-term war and a siege takes place in Yemen. But an escalation would be the opposite of what Sama says the U.S. has indicated it wants. Peace in Yemen. There was a U.S. envoy who was, you know, his sole job was to be dedicated to seeing a solution come out of this conflict in Yemen. Uh, And so I would say that the U.S. has invested so much in seeing peace come to fruition in Yemen. And what they're doing today looks like a stark contradiction to that intention. And after years of conflict that's left people without their salaries and brought weapons, disease and devastation, what's happening now leaves the people of Yemen fearful of more. For Yemenis on the ground, they don't view this for anything except for conflict, and they know what the meaning of that is. I don't think that they would see this as a move towards peace. We're seeing an escalation of violence in the entire region. Mm -hmm. And to a lot of people, I would say the average person, people outside of the political sphere, they are afraid of a World War III and a potential conflict that could lead to the use of nuclear weapons. And I think that a lot of us in the region understand that the conflict in Yemen is one of those things that could lead to that escalation. And with that threat looming, I asked Sama about how this will affect her plans to reunite with her family in Yemen. When do you think you'll be able to meet your new baby cousin or see your family in Yemen? You know, I was hoping that it would be this year because it would mark 10 years since I was last in Yemen. They restarted a bunch of planes into Yemen. Of course, they discontinued some of them, but it seems that the return to Yemen was becoming more common, more safe. And I had hoped that this year would be the year where I can go back and reunite with the family. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I feel like it is back into the category of the unknown. And that's The Take. Special thanks to Sharik Farooqi and Hussein Yasser Muhammad. This episode was produced by Chloe Kaylee and Veronisa Campana, with Sariel Khalili, Ashish Malhotra, Nagin Oliayi, Miranda Lynn, Khalid Sultan, David Enders, Amy Walters, Sonia Bagat, Zaina Badr, and me, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. This episode was mixed by Joe Plord. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Nay Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back. <laughs>